Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something that a lot of you out there are probably going to become interested in if you start a business and it grows beyond your reach to something very, very large. That's exactly what happened when a startup behavioral health organization founded in Washington, D.C. grew from a small mom-and-pop clinic serving a few dozen adults to becoming the largest nonprofit behavioral health care organization in the nation's capital with a current annual budget of more than $3 million. There were eight management issues in running a nonprofit that we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to discover what those are and how we can learn about the growing pains of running such things as a business. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest and author of the book, Lessons for Nonprofits and Startup Leaders, our guest, Maxine Harris. Maxine, thank you for being on the program today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Now, it must have been very exciting, though, when you first hit the shovel into the dirt and started this whole venture here, and you know, you were pretty much focused on making sure that everything was taken care of on your own, but pretty soon things kind of grow beyond your grasp, and you got to kind of place your trust in others to be able to do the things you were used to doing. Well, that's absolutely right, and actually, let me just add one quick thing before we uh, move on. Uh, Community Connections, uh, the organization that I founded, actually has an annual budget of $35 million. Wow. Uh, So it really, really grew. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, we now have uh, over 450 employees. Wow, that's a lot of people there. And, you know, it's funny because people get excited, and that's part of their dream is to have something grow huge, but they don't realize what comes along with it. Well, that was certainly the case with me and uh, my founding partner. Uh, We had an idea, and it had to do with providing uh, behavioral health services, uh, especially to people who usually get left out of the loop because they don't have enough money to purchase those services. And uh, before we knew it, we were treating people with addictions. We were finding low-income housing for folks. Uh, We were buying properties so that we could set those houses up in what we felt to be uh, was a humane way. And a little idea turned into a multifaceted business. Now, I'm curious, uh, you know, because you're talking about behavioral health, uh, you know, how these lessons, do they actually apply across other types of businesses as well? Yeah, I think they do. I mean, since this book came out, I've had a lot of contact with folks who are starting small tech businesses, uh, who have gotten involved in environmental uh, efforts, and what they tell me over and over again, that uh, they've dealt with the very same things. Uh, In fact, I talked to somebody the other day who was starting a real estate business, uh, which is very different from behavioral health. And he was going through the same challenges. All right. Now let's talk about what these are. uh, These things are here. Uh, First of all, we'll start off with what is called organizational culture. What exactly is that? Well, nobody starts out with uh, sort of a blanket statement. I'm going to set up this kind of culture. I mean, we all want a place where people can feel comfortable working and where the mission is clear and the communication is transparent. But those are sort of big picture general ideas. Uh, And then you kind of look around and small things like uh, how the furniture is organized, how big the building is, uh, what the demographics are of the people who get hired, start to coalesce into something we call organizational culture. Uh, And uh, it's really what it feels like to work at a place. When you walk in the door, what kind of a sense do you get of, uh, you know, what you're about to embark on? And, uh, you know, the culture often really starts from the top down. It has a lot to do with the personality of the individual who runs the organization. Now, is that also something that can be created on the fly, or is it something that has to start out that way and you build on it? Well, you know, I wish it was a static thing and you could sort of 
have an idea about the culture and, you know, add things and build on it. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, circumstances uh, intrude to change the culture, and uh, leaders have to adapt to that. Uh, Sometimes there are external pressures, perhaps in the way funding comes in, uh, regulations that get imposed, and all of a sudden you have to do things that seem antithetical to the culture you thought you had. And adaptation changes uh, what it feels like to work in a particular organization. Now, I know because I wanted to bring that up because it's interesting when you think about culture and, you know, to give people who are listening an idea of what we're talking about, you take a look at things such as maybe Google or Nike, you know, and you say, okay, well, what kind of a culture do they have and what makes it unique to work for these people? Because that's usually a way that they like to select people, isn't it, uh, to work for them? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think, uh, you know, for example, we – initially, and I think still do, pride ourselves on having a very open culture. Uh, People call each other by their first names. Uh, Doors are open. Um, It's casual and easy to make contact with people in leadership. Um, And uh, we would say we were a sort of friendly, almost family-like organization. Uh, We've also moved to having open workspaces. Uh, so that people don't get trapped and locked into offices. And different people like that, and some people don't like that. Uh, We've interviewed folks who really like a much more hierarchical organization where people's titles uh, kind of take priority over what some of their skills might be. Absolutely. It's really funny how that works. Now, how have you seen that, and has it been a challenge when it comes to organizational culture when you think about generations? Because now you're seeing in the workplace multiple generations, and I know we've done programs uh, in regards to, for instance, how boomers, uh, X generation, and like millennials all work together. Have you seen that to be a challenge? Yeah, we sure have, uh, especially because – Our founders and some of our management uh, are people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, and the people we hire are often in their 20s. Uh, They're much more tech savvy. Uh, They communicate uh, sort of quickly and with a lot of social media input. Uh, We've had uh, sort of senior level staff who barely know how to turn on a computer. Uh, And that is a challenge. Uh, And what we have really decided is that the future is with uh, younger folks and that the organization needs to adapt, especially around issues of technology, uh, to a much faster pace. Uh, But it's taken uh, training and a lot of conversation. Uh, I sometimes feel like we're really uh, having to drag the older folks along because uh, we're asking them to do things in a different way uh, than they have previously. Now, how about ideas? Now, there's a tough one right there because everybody, you know, wants to contribute, but sometimes not all ideas really actually work well. So how do you take an idea and make it come alive? And how do you decide, for instance, which ideas are worth moving forward on? Well, I think, you know, one of the things I've done is uh, really tried to give people an opportunity to put an idea uh, in, into place, to make it actual. Uh, and I've got to tell you, there are times when somebody comes to me with something and I slap my head and go, there is no way that is going to work. But I think that it is important Uh, to keep enthusiasm and creativity going in an organization, to give folks the opportunity to try out new things. Now, what you also have to do is evaluate how new ideas um, function. Uh, And uh, we'll often give people uh, a couple of months um, wanting them to keep track of data, things that seem to be working. We put more company resources in. Uh, things that have kind of fizzled, we take uh, resources away. Uh, And uh, we're always doing that, uh, helping people to nurture an idea, to test it out, but then to evaluate it. Mm -hmm. 
And that must be pretty challenging, too, because sometimes you have to kind of let go and trust, don't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, you do, and it's a balance between sort of using your experience and uh, wanting to uh, nurture creativity. I think the worst thing is for a founder leader who's been around for 30 years to fall back on the, oh, we tried that once before and it didn't work. Uh, because that's a real kind of uh, sort of a dampening effect uh, on uh, on new ideas. And just because something didn't work in the past doesn't mean it's not going to work now. Uh, but it's, it's tough to balance what you have learned uh, with new ideas that might be somewhat similar, but also harken back to things that you've tried in the past. Well, I know there's nothing more dampening, as you say, especially to the spirit or the inspiration of idea input than somebody saying, you know, well, I've been in this business a long time, you know, with the attitude, I've seen it all, I've heard it all, and quite frankly, that just isn't going to (laughs) work. Well, what makes you the authority? (laughs) Maybe the way you implemented it is the reason it didn't work. (laughs) Crazy stuff. You know, and that brings us to the next one, which I think is really important because, uh, you know, there's power, authority, and responsibility, and, and each one of those three things are very different from each other. They don't all go together, do they? <laughs> uh, no, they don't, and I think founders uh, often assume that all the power belongs to them. And I've had even people from the outside come in and say to other staff, well, you know, Maxine's in charge, and you've got to listen to what she has to say. And what that statement does is it vests all the power for big decision-making in the leader-founder's hands. And uh, that is different from having authority or responsibility. Uh, What I like to do is to think of authority as delegated power. I say to uh, people who are running different divisions within the organization, I'm going to give you the power. Uh, the authority to make decisions within your program component. Uh, And then I have to back off because I've delegated that power to somebody else. Uh, And I think that uh, responsibility is when uh, authority has been delegated uh, and maybe then delegated a second time is for someone to take responsibility for outcomes. Uh, Leaders can't be responsible for everything. Uh, Otherwise, they'd have to work 50 hours a day. And uh, obviously, that's nothing that uh, anybody can pull off. Uh, So you have to sort of take take, uh, the authority, exercise the power for those things that you can, and be willing to transfer uh, that kind of authority and responsibility to other people, and it's often to other people who are working right on the ground. They're, they're doing the day-to-day, and they're the people who are responsible for the outcomes. And you know, too, Maxine, uh, on that particular note is when somebody is afforded power, it's a matter of also getting them to understand, look, you're still working with people. Uh, and, you know, and being effective in communicating with them to inspire them in the direction that you would like to see them move. And it's interesting when you see people who become bosses, if you will, or managers, and they kind of get a feel for that power, and pretty soon they seem like they're plantation owners. <laughs> and you're thinking, no wonder everybody's miserable here. You know, you don't trust <laughs> the actions they're taking. You know, you're lording that power over them, and it just doesn't seem to inspire them to move in any particular direction, you know, to be effective. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right with that. And, and there's a real difference between being uh, the boss or the p- person who uh, asserts some kind of leadership and being bossy. Uh, bossy is really a kind of statement, you know, I'm in charge, uh, what I think is more important than what you think, Uh, conversation gets cut off, Uh, ideas get stifled, the sort of, quote, boss uh, overrides people in conversation and in generating new ideas, 
And I think that's actually correlated with not only low morale in an organization, but actually high turnover. You know, we do exit interviews when people move on to other jobs or uh, maybe other forms of uh, education. And uh, the thing that people like the best is when they feel that they are heard, even if their idea is not implemented. And the thing that they find most troubling uh, is when it does feel like an authoritarian organization uh, and the only voice that matters is the voice of the leader. And how have you been able to, uh, I suppose, address that and perhaps correct it if, it if it was possible? Well, I'll tell you, what I've had to do is bring in outside consultants and coaches. I've had a personal coach myself for the last four years, uh, and he's been great because he has been affirming, but he's also been able to say to me, okay, calm down, uh, it's okay, you don't have to rush in and assert your authority. And uh, I think it's, it's difficult for employees to say that uh, to the person who's the leader, but it's much easier for an outside coach or an outside consultant to take a look from an objective perspective and not just to give feedback, but really to give guidance uh, you know, those of us who start organizations uh, really struggle uh, with uh, relinquishing some of that authority. And, and it's, really, it's really a paradox. You need a certain kind of uh, belief in yourself uh, to start something. But too much of that can really put a damper on uh, the progress and the forward movement of the organization. I know, too, uh, since we're talking about that, sometimes stretching to, let's call your subordinates and, and encouraging uh, their ideas and their uh, their creative input can be very good for you because certainly as, let's say, you, Maxine, being the leader, uh, being in charge, the buck stops with you, you sometimes will get entrenched in a way of seeing things in a particular way, so it's hard to see beyond that. And that's where those fresh eyes can kind of come in and let you go, you know, I didn't think about it that way before, because you can't solve problems, as Einstein would say, with the same thinking that created them in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that true? This next one I know has got to be a challenge for anybody out there. You know, I've always been curious myself what people look for, what they're listening for when it comes to hiring somebody. You know, because I've been on, I remember years ago, interviews myself thinking, you know, I know I had a pretty stellar interview, but what I was saying to these people I believe in, I actually put into practice. You know, I do believe in teamwork and things like that. And then they go with someone else, and then you might follow up and think, well, you know, who is this person, you know, and how come I didn't get the job? What, 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 what goes on there in the hiring process? And I know it gets more complicated, especially if you implement something like a human resources department. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we certainly didn't have uh, anything even vaguely resembling human resources when we started. Um, But uh, one of the things that we have uh, done as we've evolved, uh, we have really an interview process that involves several people. Uh, There's a screen on the phone. There's an interview with a senior staff person. There's an interview with the entire team. Uh, Because we're behavioral health and we work with uh, clients, there's a chance to talk to those folks. We also do a day or two of shadowing where a prospective employee goes out into the field uh, with someone who's been there for a while and gets a real hands-on feel for what the job is going to be like. And I can tell you, most times there's really consensus If the team likes somebody, the odds are that person is going to like the team. And uh, we found that we've made much better hiring decisions when we have this kind of uh, collaborative process. Yeah, I remember a a place, and it was funny because I talked with the general manager. uh, This was probably a couple of weeks after I was brought on board in this company. 
And she said simply what I do. You can tell me about all your experience, and I'm sure you're probably loaded with it, but I like to have a really nice casual conversation. In this particular situation, it was very unique because most of the time what you were hearing from people who were trying to hire is bragging about how great their company is and what they're doing, and it's like they never ask you about you. And that was a red flag for me right off. If you mm-hmm. think your company is so great, then what are you hiring for? <laughs> you know, and, and you just walk the other way. But in this situation, it was more like we were just sitting on a porch, you know, drinking lemonade, just talking about things. And it didn't even feel like an interview at all. And she says, I do that because I want to get a feel for what would this person be like working with this person who's already on the team and these people here. What would that be like? And she says, that's how I make the decision about who I bring on board. You know, and I thought, you know, that almost sounds genius with the common sense involved. But, yeah, how well will this person actually fit in with the culture that's already there, as we talked about earlier? Yeah, I think that's just right. And, and that's why we have prospective employees actually spend a day uh, with people who are on the team. And uh, team members then get a real feel for what it would be like uh, to work with somebody. And that's really independent of credentials. You can have somebody with, uh, you know, a great degree and uh, a lot of, even a lot of experience, but if they don't fit in and they don't feel right to other people, then it's not going to be a good match. Yeah, and they could have little, almost no experience, but look, if they fit in, then the desire for the team to kind of nurture them along as well as their enthusiasm and initiative to want to contribute to make the team successful, you know, you've got a winning match going on right there, and a lot of loyalty being built, too, as well, I would think. You know, I I think that's right. I mean, what we've come to realize is uh, one of the best qualities for the kind of work we do is passion. Uh, you've really got to be passionate about uh, getting out there, maybe sometimes going into neighborhoods that aren't so great, uh, helping people who might want to be helped and maybe they're a little reluctant about being helped. And if you don't feel passionately about that kind of social mission, uh, then all the other things that get in the way of a job will just overwhelm you. Which gets to our next one, problem solving. Well, you know, every organization has problems. And uh, one of the things that has been important for us is to carefully define what the problem is. Uh, Sometimes, especially in our field, uh, staff turnover is uh, a very, what we think, big issue. Uh, and uh, we've done lots of things to try to solve that. Until we brought somebody in, uh, and uh, she took a look, and she said, well, staff turnover is not a problem here. Uh, It's really how you define the right amount of longevity for the work you do. Uh, If this is really a two-year job, and people come, and they learn, and they are able to participate in the mission of the organization, maybe two years is just the right amount of time. And you should stop sort of fretting about how to solve that problem. Maybe it's not a problem at all. And I think that solving the right problem, knowing why you're going to solve something that seems a little bit off, is really critical if you're going to be successful. Because another way to look at that, too, let's just say that that cycle uh, is true, you know, for two years. How well those people felt treated, how well they felt they were able to contribute to that culture as they were growing perhaps beyond the borders of that particular organization, it comes to a point that as maybe they fledgling off somewhere else, they begin sending people to you, <laughs> uh, you know, and therefore you're you're solving your hiring problem. Boy, is that the truth. I mean, mm. we have a big internship and training program, and that's actually been a great source of new employees. Um, I think also, you know, if you think when people leave that that's a bad thing, then you just work like crazy to keep people. And what I've actually found is that when people get training when they love the job 
and then they decide to move on and maybe participate at a higher level in another organization, that means we've done something right. There you go. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of uh, years and years ago when I worked for my uh, my stepfather and his company. Uh, it was a machining company, and uh, he had an old machinist there, and he taught me a very valuable lesson that I carried forward and implemented from that point forward. And he says, you got to think about this, because especially back in the early 80s, you know, there was a lot of uh, – uh, turnover, layoffs, people getting fired, so people were concerned about their jobs. And and uh, certainly you wouldn't want to train somebody who ends up being able to be so skilled they could replace you, so you wouldn't do something like that. But what he said was that if you can train or teach somebody to do something better than you do it, you have just become irreplaceable. And I thought about that and thought, you know, well, if I can do that, he, you know, he's right. <laughs> you know, because once you leave, you just left a void there. If that comes down to it, all you have is a, somebody who's highly skilled, maybe even more skilled than you were, who's filling those shoes, but could they do the same thing you just did that brought them to that level in the first place? Yeah, I think being a model, being a mentor uh, is very important for senior staff to do with incoming staff. Uh, we also have, um, you know, given that we've been in existence for 30 years, uh, a lot of the mental health professionals in the city have actually come through our doors as employees. And they go out there as emissaries. Um, they uh, really appreciate the learning that went on. And, uh, you know, they are very complimentary as they move up the ladder in their careers uh, and I think it, it kind of comes back in a very positive way to the organization. Oh, sure it does. I don't see how it couldn't. <laughs> That's marvelous, that ripple effect that gets mm-hmm. out there and roots itself in many ways you couldn't even imagine. That's very inspiring. Which comes to engaging the outside world. Let's talk about what that is exactly and, and what we do there. We know, in our business, uh, we deal with a lot of regulations. Um, and this probably is true with, with many businesses. Uh, there are federal regulations. There are regulations that are put in place because of our payers. And uh, for a long time, we really thought, well, we can just sort of hum along, do our thing, and we don't really have to pay any attention to that. Uh, and uh, so a regulation would come down, and we would adapt to it. And what we started to realize is if we engaged earlier on, we could actually have some input in designing those regulations. Uh, So we kind of moved out of our shell and became uh, really players in the city, Uh, helped to develop a uh, behavioral health uh, organization where other uh, other agencies like ours came together talked about problems, talked about citywide ideas, uh, and uh, being engaged like that, uh, you really do learn new things, you have a chance to influence policy, and you really form a uh, larger and more kind of hefty unit uh, when you are engaged with people outside uh, your organization. Uh, when Community Connections goes out there and says, this is how we feel, that's one thing. But when we go out there partnered with 10 other organizations, it has a much bigger input on uh, how the city is going to design uh, its services going forward. See, and you hit on something that's very powerful, and it's, it's a point where you know I have felt an observation that America has become lazy. Uh, When it comes to our government, you know, our politics, things like that, they sort of like, well, here's the problem. We're just going to throw it in there, and we're going to let the government, you know, solve it. And the next thing you know, they don't like the solution. (laughs) And it's like, did you realize that it starts with a community? It's much like your business. That's one community. But that when you start pulling together other communities or other uh, like-minded companies, that you're not sitting back allowing these people to make arbitrary rules that don't work or that you may not like, but you're proactively involved in making these things happen. That's the power you have. And it's funny when you hear 
you know, that sort of a situation, new president coming in office, oh, we don't like this guy, so we're going to rally, you know, anti-support of this guy. It's like, but what effectiveness does that have? Where were you when it came time to vote? Where were you long before the voting process even started when it came to all this? No, you sat around and waited, and now you're going to snivel and whine about the outcome. <laughs> and it takes, it takes work to roll up your sleeves, as you say, engaging in the outside world. Yeah, we see ourselves as an activist organization. Uh, I think one of the big mistakes that businesses make is to sit back passively uh, and wait for somebody else to make the decisions that you're going to have to live with. Uh, If you get out there early on and you've got ideas and you've got experience, uh, you can really have an impact on the way your field moves going forward. And that comes to self and organizational awareness. Now, what is that? How would you define that? Well, this is not to be mistaken for therapy, but it kind of teeters sometimes right on the edge. Uh, You've got to understand, uh, more than anything, your impact on other people. Uh, Some people will walk into a room and the room falls silent. Uh, and they just don't understand why. Uh, And they need to really step back, take a look at themselves, understand what impact they have. And uh, if that impact is not producing the result that they want, they have to modify it. Uh, I remember one uh, outside consultant uh, who said to me, go into the room and start the meeting, And then sit back and listen and see what happens because you'll be changing your impact on that meeting. And it was a real eye-opener because I saw some people speak up who hadn't before, uh, other people kind of look around and wondering what was going on. And it gave me a window into seeing what my impact was. And I I think that kind of self-awareness Uh, is really critical when you ask people to join you in any kind of endeavor, inside the organization or out. Uh, If people see you as passive, they will respond in one way. If they see you as too aggressive, they will respond in another way. Uh, And you need to know how you're coming across. That's the kind of self-awareness that I think is uh, critical for any business. Absolutely. And we come to the final one, which to me seems a little kind of uh, crazy because you can't predict the future, but it's preparing for the future. How does, a, how does an organization go about doing that? What is it that they're preparing for, do you think? Well, I think you really have to have a deep bench, and you have to put uh, time and energy into that. You have to be intentional. Uh, we've spent uh, quite a bit of resource getting training for people. Uh, We've partnered with uh, the local university, one of the local universities, uh, Georgetown, and their business school. Uh, We've had training for our younger staff. We've done cross-training so that people in one department understand what people in another department are doing. And if somebody sort of falls out uh, for an unexpected reason, there are lots of people who can step in. Um, This is not a sort of situation where one person gets anointed uh, to be the next leader, but where a lot of people uh, know enough that they can really uh, step in, uh, take something over, and they feel that they have the skills. Uh, You can't just ask somebody to do a job without having first given them the tools to do that job. So I think succession has to be a very purposeful, uh, well-thought-out endeavor. Uh, Otherwise, the leader or the founder uh, leaves, uh, perhaps passes away suddenly, and nobody knows what to do. Right, yeah. Then all of a sudden the company crumbles. It's like, why didn't anybody step up and at least try? (laughs) That's right. And and why didn't the people who were there before give them the tools, give them the training, give them the experience? Um, 
you know, sometimes I think leaders uh, get very protective of their position. And uh, even though they want to be good stewards of their organization, uh, they can be a little stingy about giving the resources and the skills to others. And if you believe in your business and you want it to succeed, you really have to do that. Absolutely. I don't know why, but I was reminded of the uh, movie uh, starring Humphrey Bogart, Mutiny on the Bounty, mm-hmm. you know, and they just couldn't wait for the old man to fail. And it's like, what kind of a team is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe he was flipping out, but why didn't you guys step up and help him, you know, and move him in the right direction? No, you just let him go right down the toilet, you know. That's, I was just like, right. oh, goodness. Crazy stuff, and it's certainly a lot for people to take in. The book is Lessons for Nonprofit and Startup Leaders, and this is Tales from a Reluctant, Reluctant CEO. And I don't think you were too reluctant, though, were you? Well, you know, my personality is uh, not to sort of hold back, but I was reluctant about becoming a businesswoman. Ah. Uh, and I think uh, that that's really where the reluctance came in. I was trained to be a therapist, a behavioral health counselor, and uh, business was about the farthest thing from my mind uh, when I started. And uh, running a business or a big organization requires that you take on some of those business skills, uh, that you understand what a balance sheet is. And uh, I think I was uh, reluctant about uh, moving in that direction, a a bit afraid that I would lose my identity uh, as um, as a practitioner. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way, too, and certainly hear enough stories, oh, I like it back when we were just in the garage tinkering around. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is certainly uh, you know, a great place for a lot of people to at least open their eyes should they start an idea and move it into you know, a small practice, and then eventually you never know it could become a large one when you were saying you know, something like, what was it, 400 people that work in your organization uh, when I go back to the machining days with uh, my stepfather, is that uh, the Leatherman Tool was one of those kind of companies. And for people who are familiar, that's the one that has that's the Swiss style Army knife, you know, that's uh, that's sold out there. And uh, I remember, you know, delivering parts to them. You know, three or four people is all they had. Mm-hmm. And you know, now they're up to 400 people, and and it's been that way since the 90s. You know, so. Uh, pretty amazing stuff going on when you see companies growing. You wonder, how do they adapt when it seems like they just explode to those levels? But be prepared because what you have happening may come to that level, and it's certainly nice to have you know, a nice uh, schematic, if you will, or a plan such as this book you have here for people to be aware. Well, you know, if this stuff comes along the pipeline, at least you're preparing for the future as we were talking about. Well, and it's great to know that somebody else has been through the same things you've been through. Um, This is not a one-time thing, and other people have experienced it. And uh, they come up with some solutions, and it also makes you feel a whole lot less alone. Um, Leaders can really feel like they're out there all by themselves, and uh, you don't have to because other people have walked this way before. And always remember this, too, just because you may have what seems to be a solution like some of the ones that you offer in your book doesn't mean it's going to all turn out okay. You still have to stretch it, mold it, and work with it within the capacity of your experience. (laughs) Anybody who's built a model knows this. No, you have to make it your own. That's right. Well, Maxine, I want to thank you for being on the program today. And I wonder, is there a website people can find out more about your work and how they can get the book, things like that? Yeah, uh, they can go to ccdc, uh, the number one, dot org. And that stands for Community Connections DC, number one, dot org. Not to be confused with ACDC, the rock group, it's CCDC. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want you going to the wrong website. <laughs> it could be fun while you're reading the book to go to that other website if you want to. But Anyway, Maxine, thank you so much for being on the program today. Well, it's been a pleasure. You thank bet. you. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. And be sure to keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50, as well as our upcoming shows. 
I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway.